Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's seminar. Okay, we have two speakers today. They actually have been working together for 10 years. More than 10 years. Oh, almost 20 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rosalie from Powerflex uh, and even though from Caltech. Uh, let me remind everyone that the next seminar is, is in two weeks, not next week. George was the co founder and CEO of this Caltech startup company called Powerflex. Uh, it has been acquired by BDS Renewables a few years ago, and he's now the chief product officer. Uh, George invented and built the company's original fully programmable level 2 EV charges with real time setting, orchestration, and control, and was responsible for executing both the technology and business strategy of our press from the beginning. Uh, George holds a bachelor's degree in ECS. From MIT and Master in Computer Science of Caltech. Uh, Stephen is a human professor of the Department of Computing and Medical Science in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Caltech and has been an honorary professor at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he has received numerous awards, uh, including the uh, IEEE Infocom Achievement Award and uh, ACM Symmetrics Test of Time Award, and he's a fellow of IEEE. Uh, he received uh, his bachelor from Cornell University uh, and PhD from uh, East Coast University. Right. And that's where I met Steve. Okay, so without further okay. delay, uh, I'll let him share the screen. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chimu. So let uh, I will start and then, but then the real tree is to hear from George. <laughs> Thanks again, Chimu. Uh, so we met at Berkeley when I was a grad student. So a long time. <laughs> that was a long, long time ago, before time. Uh, so I'll talk about adaptive charging network uh, and how we got from research to something real because of George. That's the EV charging startup Powerflex uh, that was acquired by EDF uh, two year, uh, three years ago, 2019. Co-founded. So, uh, so we started, we used to work, George and I actually both used to work on the internet research. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started to really learn about power systems from scratch. So we did quite a bit of work on the theory side and trying to understand power systems, especially as we decarbonize the grid. Uh, what are the emerging issues and how do we address them and so on and so forth. So there's been a lot of uh, interesting theoretical research that's done. And as you well know, not every piece of good research may have immediate applications, and most of them don't. Uh, but it, it was um, luckily that some of the research that we've done really can be applied to address some of the issues. And, and George invented this uh, smart EV charger, which was the industry first, uh, that really allow us to do real-time communication, computing, and control. So that started the whole effort to really try to deploy this technology, uh, first at Caltech, and then eventually through the startup, and then now uh, the business scale uh, through EDF. So it's basically this story that, that, that we're going to talk about. OK, uh, so I just want to acknowledge early contributors. Uh, so George, of course, uh, you led the team that founded the PowerFlex from scratch, uh, really from his garage, yeah, garage at home, and, and eventually uh, became PowerFlex. And then we have early contributors from various people, a lot of people at Caltech, students, research staff, and also visitor students. Uh, from Europe as, as amazing students. So I talk about the Caltech test bed that George built first at Caltech. And then when you transition into a commercial operation, then it's no longer a test bed that we can play with and break. And we build a research portal. So that was done by a PhD student at Caltech, Zach Lee, uh, who's now at Caltech. So I talk about uh, the test bed and also the, the work that Zach Lee has done building the research portal on top of the physical system. Then George can tell about how he built a business case, build a company, and some of the challenges that we're deployment. And then if we have time and we can skip this, I'll tell you a little bit about a theory where that is really motivated by this kind of work. That is, you really have to optimize not just the grid, but also the end distributed energy resources, such as the EV charging or the smart inverters or smart buildings. Then you really have to think about uh, modeling the three phase network end to end differently from the traditional method. So, and then hopefully we'll leave more times 
for Q and A, and you can ask all kinds of questions about how do you build clean tech startups uh, and all the challenges to get that off the ground. So the test bed, uh, the two references uh, contains more a lot of details. And I guess we are all familiar why we are interested in this. So California, for example, has made a commitment to have a fifty percent originally of renewables by twenty thirty. We are overshooting on target, which is great. So it becomes sixty percent now and 100% by 2045. On the transportation side, they're going to a 5 million zero emission vehicles, which mostly will probably be electric vehicles by 2030, right? So if you look at in the US, um, the electricity generation and transportation concern about two thirds of all primary energies. And they meet between 55 to 60% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, if you really want to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emission, you have to electrify transportation and generate electricity from clean renewable sources. So another thing that for those who are familiar with the duck curve, if you say, I want to feel the value of the duck curve, then you can charge about 13 million EV. Right? So you can solve both the transportation requirement and also the duck curve problem if you have a lot of Workplace DB charging. That's that's what we did. So uh, it's twice as likely for someone to get an EV if there is workplace charging, according to some survey by EDF. So this is the um, the system that George Bell had, the first system that he built in 2016. So this is a garage at Caltech. Uh, from the electric room, he built this set of. Uh, the transformers and breakers and uh, controllers and everything, uh, and then connect to all the smart chargers uh, that he built from his garage. Um, so that was the physical system that supplied power from the electric room in the garage to each of those smart chargers. Mm -hmm. The cyber system to go with that is that when a driver plugs in a EV, there's a mobile app. Through the app, the driver can tell the system how much energy she or he needs. So I need 30 miles and also the expected departure time. And then the system will have that information for every EV in the garage, how much energy they need and by what deadline. So that information is sent to the public cloud and where a lot of the computation is done. And the computation is relatively simple. Every two minutes or so, you form a complex quadratic constraint quadratic program. You solve that problem, uh, QCQB is complex, and then that will determine the charging rate for every EV in the garage for the next two minutes. And then the next two minutes comes around, you repeat. So you, you look at the state, you form a new QCQP, you solve that, and then you, you get your charging optimal charging rate for every EV in the garage. So that, that's how it works. The This simple QCQP is very flexible. The, for example, the objective function can encode different preferences of that side host. So the side host may say, I think you want to charge as fast as possible for every EV in the garage. You can say, I want to maximally utilize my on-site solar generation. Or I want to charge in the way, charge my cars in the garage in the way that will minimize my electricity bill, for example, or a combination of those. So all of those, depending on the side host, you can encode into the objective function. The constraints, takes care of say, the energy requirement before the deadline, the capacity, safety constraints, and, and others. So they will determine, again, in real time, the charging rates of all the EVs in the garage. So that's how the uh, cyber system works. That's George and his brother. <laughs> uh, that night before, before you got energized, uh, uh, mid uh, February 2016. So that was, the, that was the research prototype. It was the first generation uh, smart chargers that George built, and then now it's all uh, standardized commodity, uh, and, and there was the garage and all of that. Okay, so that was 2016. Uh, by July 2020, so this garage has delivered one gigawatt of energy, corresponding to about more than 3 million miles, um, a thousand tons of oil CO2. Um, so you would, so the company, and then was to build a company and deploy it uh, outside Caltech uh, at Slack as well here. Um, so it was acquired, and she will tell you a lot more details on, on that story. Uh, 
and, and I encourage you to talk to ask him all the questions, all the tough questions at the end. So there's some uh, interesting statistics, which actually is pretty consistent with what people see around the world. So roughly, uh, for example, each EV um, every day is about, they will take about 10 to 11 kilowatt hours. That's the typical average driving distance um, need. Um, Caltech, for example, people spend on average six hours, but they can typically finish charging in let's say two hours, which means that there's a lot of flexibility, inherent flexibility that's extremely valuable to help innovate renewables, which currently is not tapped. And therefore, the system uh, that we build really try to untap, to really extract its untapped value, which would be important. So let me show you some more pictures. So this is the uh, charging rate in ends over 24 hours. So each curve corresponds to one dB. Right? So you can you can modulate the charging rates and so on to achieve different objectives subject to various constraints. So this is early um, uh, demonstration at JPL. This was 2016. So the idea is that we can demonstrate that you can in real time control the charging rate, aggregate charging rate of the garage, for example, to say track a signal. So in this case, it was the real-time PV signal, actually, I think out of uh, George's uh, rooftop. Um, and then you can see that uh, using the JPL installation, uh, you can track the signal pretty well. Except during lunch hour. Um, at the time, we only had eight charges at JPL, so during lunch hour, uh, you simply don't have enough to track, but otherwise, you do have the ability to track in real time. So this is a... Um, uh, installation at NREL in 2018. And the idea is we want to reduce demand charge for those, those who know. Basically, we want to control the peak. So this is the building load over the weekend. You can see the up curve over the weekend. There's not much building load. During weekday, you do see this building load that fluctuates. Uh, you can still see a bit of a duck curve. And this is the EV charge. And so this is the net load from the building minus the on-site PV plus the EV load. So the point is that you can control the EV charging so that the peak doesn't exceed, let's say, whatever you specify. And that's how you can reduce the charging demand and therefore reduce your operating costs. This is the impact of COVID, so March uh, 2020. Uh, okay, so that's the, that's the physical infrastructure that was built at Caltech. Uh, in the end of 2018, so before November 2018, is a test bed where we, we offer free charging and we encourage people even outside Caltech to charge so that we get the data about the system and all of that. After 2018 November, you transition to commercial operation and therefore uh, drivers have to pay now. So we can no longer just break the system. And the idea here is to say, we want to build a software layer on top of the physical system, they will make it, everything's open source, they will make it a research facility that's available uh, worldwide. And it provides three things. So that's the um, uh, references. It provides, oh, so that's the, you can, um, November 2018, we start to charge payment. Uh, the number of charging second drops, and now you have to pay. Um, and and that, that's cool. Okay, so, so the idea, is that we, we want to build this uh, layer, software layer on top of the physical system that will provide real-time fine-grained charging data that people can use it for all kinds of purposes. Uh, also provide a realistic simulator environment for people who are interested in say, coming up with new charging algorithms or even pricing algorithms. Then they don't have to simulate all the infrastructure. They can just focus on simulating their own algorithm and running this simulator environment. And then the third piece is ATM line. And the idea is that you, once you have a control algorithm that you're happy with, you, you test with the simulator, then we can allow you to charge the actual cars at Caltech. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, okay, so ATM data. Uh, March 2021, about 80,000 fine green uh, EV charging sessions. It's publicly available, everything is open source. If you want to use it, fantastic. If you want to contribute towards that, even better. So you can use it for all kinds of things. You can use it for modeling user behavior. Maybe you're interested in machine learning algorithms. You can use it to evaluate your charging algorithm or pricing algorithm. You can use it to evaluate what is the facilities, um, the, the, the charging 
flexibility of your facility, for example. Uh, or what is if you have a lot of smart charging garages on a feeder, what is the impact, for example? Uh, so these are just small pictures. So this shows the flexibility at Caltech during the weekday, during the weekend, uh, at JPRs, and so on. And the conclusion is that compared with if you do uncontrolled charging, you need about almost four times fewer capacity in your system. That translates into a lower cap, uh, capital cost. And, and George can tell you what that means on the, on the, on the business side later on. You can use, again, use the data to look at the user behavior. So you can look at the arrival times and so on. And one thing you see is that post COVID, the variance bigger because it's hybrid. So people's uh, arrival departure time uh, is different from the pre COVID. Um, you can use gas emission models to try to model the arrivals, the departures, the energies, and all of that. Once you build a model, you can use it to simulate all kinds of different, for different purposes, say machine learning, control optimizations, and so on. You can use the model to, to do those. So that's the, uh, where you can get all the data. Again, everything is open source, extensible. Uh, okay, so that's the data piece. Uh, so that leads, who cool, was a PhD student, also build a realistic ACM simulator that will simulate this battery behavior. You can do X, DKI C1. Um, uh, so he chose a battery, behavior, a battery model, which is reasonably simple, yet realistic enough for his purpose. Uh, it, it includes simulation of EV behavior, um, the discharge behavior, the constraints that depends on, let's say, uh, your transformers and breakers and the, the, the infrastructure is built in the garage. Uh, and also, uh, there's some constraints in the networks. You can also take ACM data that would drive the simulation. You can also take other signals, such as utility tariffs. If you have fuel use and you want to optimize your charging to minimize your electricity bill, you, use, you can use that. You can look at the solar generation that can drive your simulators and so on. And therefore, the simulator is, is very realistic so that as long as you interface with that, you don't have to recreate this simulation environment. You can just focus on the algorithm that you are interested in and just run in this simulator. So that's your algorithm. Um, and ACM light, the idea is the same interface, but underneath that is different. Underneath that is a real garage uh, at Caltech. So the idea is that, let's say if you want to uh, try a new control charging algorithm, you can issue a charging command. There will be a layer that will capture your command and check if it's safe. If it is not safe, you will just use the default PowerFlex charging algorithm. Otherwise, you will use your algorithm to charge the car, measure the state, send it back to your algorithm, and then you can uh, continue. So this piece is not entirely done uh, because of good reasons. Uh, so anyone interested in that? You should let Zach know. So he's on a power plant. I'm working with George. Uh, okay, so Great. this is the exciting you. part. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so when uh, Stephen and I were at Caltech, uh, we were looking at building out all these EV chargers for the campus, right? And so you know, we did a bunch of models and uh, we looked at costs and got some quotes and the uh, the cost that came back was like a million dollars. It was basically impossible, right? So um, there's something like 15,000 15, per charger. And uh, we realized at that point that uh, this is not just a Caltech problem. This is a, a global issue. You can't be spending, that's not cost effective. It's never gonna, we're never gonna get to the goal that we need to get to for California if, if that was the case. Um, and so, uh, you know, we went on this journey to innovate uh, improvements in anything from design to deployment to instruction, all these things, and we were able to get it down to uh, three thousand dollars per per stall, and that was uh, a pretty big game changer. We thought a five x difference, and so uh, that's when we decided we should probably commercialize and uh, and do something. Uh, yeah. 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 It's oh the the decrease um, generally so uh, 
there's this thing called load management, and that allows you to oversubscribe circuits. Um, and that in, in return, that makes you have to do less infrastructure. And, and so it's a cascading effect where um, by doing things more efficiently, it's a big, it's a big savings. Yeah. But I'll get into that later with a few more slides. So good question though. And so we looked at other things and um, once you build the site, you have to operate it as well. So you have to pay the electrical bill, right? And so if you look at um, uh, this curve here, you can see this is the over 24 hours, 40 kilowatts. So um, you really need to reduce the peak and that's where the uh, load management comes in. You can actually still satisfy all the requirements of your drivers, but uh, make sure that your peaks are are are, are less. Right? Um, and so what we saw was like most people showed up at Caltech at like 10 a.m. and then like there'd be this crazy, crazy peak. And so if you needed to satisfy this, you'd have to build your infrastructure to above this line. And that's where it gets really expensive because you know, you're wasting all that capacity here and here. Right. So that load management really comes in handy. Uh, we worked with other uh, schools. Uh, UC San Diego was another one. They have a um, interest of lowering the carbon intensity. So this blue line is the real time carbon intensity for UCSD. And they said, hey, you can charge as much as you want, but keep it under the signal, right? And so we built the algorithm so that we can take in any signal and then just shape the curve underneath and still satisfy all the cars before they need to leave. Uh, and then grid services, um, if you look, if you think about a really large scale, let's say you have, you know, a million chargers out there and then they're all in different places and, um, you know, instability of the grid is, is, is uh, really important to address. And so programs like demand response, um, you know, you might get an alert from pg e or whoever and say, hey, like, please reduce 50% uh, of your load immediately. And so our system can still do that. Um, and maybe for an hour, and then we can still satisfy all the all the requirements for each one of these drivers. So a lot of value you can extract um, indirectly. Oh, we're hiring. So our headquarters are in Los Altos, less than ten minutes away. You could ride your bike there, um, but we have lots of positions open. Uh, we're about two hundred people now. Um, we have offices in San Diego, here, Manhattan. And um, a lot of people will work remotely as well. So, uh, okay, cool. Let me. How do I jump to the other, other presentation? Uh, uh, okay. Okay. I think I got it. Uh, okay. Well, let's play from the start. All right. Cool. So, I got a couple of slides here on PowerFlex uh, post uh, academic academia. <laughs> So we have about 10,000 stations deployed, mostly in California now. Uh, we also do battery storage, so 500 megawatts, uh, so solar, 500 megawatts there. Uh, we're actually the uh, nation's second largest uh, commercial solar installer. So we do solar for like target warehouses on top and a lot, lot of really big uh, projects. And then uh, a lot of commercial storage. So um, these are batteries, stationary storage batteries that um, can help with these assets. We do everything from uh, hardware only to turnkey. Um, a lot of times the customer wants one firm to be able to address all the energy needs. And also when you have all these resources, you need to um, optimize them jointly because if you have separate vendors for each one of these, they may have different uh, you know, uh, directives and, and that's not optimal. So it's very important to jointly optimize. Uh, here's the vision, the long range vision is uh, virtual a VPP, virtual power plant. Uh, so the idea is that if you have enough, enough of these assets uh, around uh, the country, then you can basically coordinate them in such a way where uh, it's like having a power plant. Um, so you, you see these as like a building like this, you might have a lot of solar up top, a bunch of charging stations, uh, battery storage. Um, and this is really the, the future that we're all uh, building towards. In terms of customers and verticals, uh, we're actually um, in, in a lot of places. So uh, different cities, like we're, we're the provider for Palo Alto here, um, San Francisco, San Jose, uh, a lot of real estate, uh, private sector things, a lot of universities, uh, a lot of OEMs, uh, different cars here. Uh, but we do the charging for their factories and things like that. A lot of nonprofit, a lot of museums, um, a lot of fun stuff there. 
research labs like Slack, JPL, workplaces, um, and and fleets. So um, these are the the things that we've been focusing more on large scale. So each one of these sites generally has um, 30 plus chargers at one time, because that's really when the load management is uh, is applicable. If you only have like two chargers, uh, you could just do basic algebra and figure that out. <laughs> not, 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 not hard. So <clears throat> different cars, different needs. This is really important too, because you might have a plug-in hybrid that can run on gasoline. So they don't need to charge every day. Their batteries are really small. Um, but you know they they do take up a stall, so so it, it is something you have to manage. Then you have like small battery EVs, like the BMW i3. Um, this guy has to charge every day, or else he may ain't getting home. So that's that's really important. And then you got the larger uh, long range EVs, which don't have to charge every day, but when they do charge, it's a lot of energy at one time, right? So um, the algorithm has got to be able to satisfy all these different classes of vehicles um, at the same time. One slide about load management. So uh, the National Electric Code uh, looks at EV charging as a um, continuous load. And what that means is that you have to have capacity available um, 24 hours a day for that charger, for that those chargers. So on a standard electric panel, you might only get 18 chargers before you hit that limit. So uh, I think in 2014, the electric code uh, amend, was amended to allow load management, and that's kind of what um, we pioneered: is the ability to, to use software and math to uh, make sure that even if you install, you know, five, six, seven, ten times more dispensers, that um, you're keeping everything safe on the panel board here. So the software and the math is making sure that you're not popping breakers and and causing an unsafe environment. Uh, one slide here on uh, the charge curves, very similar to what uh, Stephen showed earlier, but if you do uncontrolled charging, then you're going to have these, these spikes, right? And so each color is a car, and um, as long as you cap them all together then and solve it before they need to leave, then, then it's actually fine. So a lot of cool things here. Um, here is a graph of a standard 24-hour uh, building, right? So the dotted, the thicker dotted line is the uh, the base load or the, the usage over the day. Solar is the curve, and you can see if you add stationary storage, if you add um, in all together, that really you can uh, really reduce um, the, the needs of uh, the, your connection to the grid. Uh, Four to nine p.m. is the peak period down in California, so you want to really avoid usage in that period. You can see here that. During that time, uh, this load is all being taken care of by storage. Yeah. Actually, sorry, over here. A uh, couple examples. Uh, yeah, so it's like City of Palo Alto, we have over 50 chargers there. There's another 100 being built. Uh, we've done like all the downtown garages, uh, the uh, the libraries, the the junior zoo, you know, all, all these things. So a lot of fun there. Um, we're in County of Los Angeles, so this is over a hundred different sites, uh, like Walt Disney Concert Hall, like uh, you know, just the the, the jails, the, all those things there. Uh, so another pretty big customer um, being used daily. Uh, LAX International Airport, we installed twelve hundred chargers um, there. I think a couple months ago, this was the biggest project at any airport um, in the world, I believe, right now. So. You can find us in any of the short-term or long-term parking lots. Uh, we were able to do all these chargers without upgrading any of their infrastructure um, because there was just no more power to, to give out anyway. So having load management is a, is a uh, key, uh, key differentiator here. Uh, fleets, this is like uh, DHL. So we're their provider of the charging for all their depots. So the packages come in you know, on their plane and then it goes on a bigger truck to like a depot, they might have a depot. The depot around here is in Sunnyvale, but and then they have all these last mile electric trucks that actually deliver the package to your doorstep. So this is a mission critical, like because if they don't charge their vehicles, then they can't deliver the packages. It's really important to make sure that this is uh, always working for them. And then last slide on the nonprofit. So this is uh, Getty Center in uh, Los Angeles. Um, you know, so world class facility. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we provide charging for all their guests and staff um, there. So um, we're hiring. <laughs>
in summary. So, uh, okay. do you want to go back to yours? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So here in Stanford, why are we going to go into the launch and so huge charging? Yeah, so <laughs> funny story. Funny you ask that. We actually came to talk to Stanford, I think, three, four years ago. And I guess maybe so I talked to the wrong person. It was the director of transportation at the time. And he said, We actually don't want more people driving here. We want you on bicycles. So that was that was the response that I got uh, a couple of years ago. And that's why we went over to Slack and then we installed like 60 chargers at Slack. But I think the world has changed, and I think that um, there's a lot more EVs on the road. So, you know, we would be more than happy to come here and install a couple hundred for you guys um, if you would like. <laughs> so, I, I think it's more of a policy management question. Yeah. Uh, do you, where's yeah, your, okay, where's okay. your, oh. yeah. okay, great. Sorry, jump over that. Uh, sure. Uh, so, let me, Maybe uh, I want to leave more time for Q and A, so maybe um, I will just uh, skip some of the slides, but just tell you uh, five minutes. Let me see. Yeah, uh, five minutes or so. Tell you. Um, so the work really motivated. We have to think about three-phase modeling, power flow analysis, and optimization slightly differently from how we do this traditionally and. Let me just tell you the, uh, the problem, which is the current way of thinking, uh, and then the, the details, shameless advertisements. I'm writing a test for the details all here, so, so you can take a look. All right, so the motivation. Um, so most papers and research papers, uh, ourselves included, we really think of the powerful analysis uh, in a single phase environment. And that is great for transmission system, a lot of transmission system applications. Or you could define an algorithm, so I'm not that interested in the details of my infrastructure, but I want to demonstrate my algorithm works. Typically, a single phase model is good enough to, for that purpose. However, when you're actually controlling optimize, on optimizing the actual system, like the EV charging or smart buildings and so on, you are not controlling the right variables. You'll see that in the next slide. You could model your system using a single phase model. You really have to look at the unbalanced three phase model much more carefully. And if you don't do that, uh, you may get into trouble. We'll see the slide of that when you actually implement the system, which is three phase. So that, that's, the, that's the motivation. So let me get into a bit of what I mean by that. So if you look at a network, which Basically, is a bunch of devices. These can be voltage sources, current sources, impedances, or constant power sources. They are connected by transmission lines or transformers. So this is one segment where you have one device connected to a transmission line. So this is the Pi model for those who may have taken power systems. So this model is a transmission line or a transformer and connect to another device or another node and so on and so forth. So that's how you build a network. Now, if your system is single phase or if your system is three phase, the difference at this level is trivial. For example, if you look at the line currents in this three phase system, how they relate to the voltages at this terminal, VJ, phases ABC, and at this terminal, uh, it should be VK, ABC, then the equation looks exactly the same, whether it's a single phase or three phase. In a single phase case, these are failure. These are complex numbers. Failure. In a three phase case, these are metrics, and these are three by three complex matrices. That's the only difference. But formally, structurally, they are exactly the same. And different, if you're modeling your system at this level, three phase is trivial. It's a trivial extension of the three phase. However, if you are dealing with the kind of system that George described earlier, where you have to optimize and control the actual charges. So you're not controlling these variables, you're controlling internal variables inside your three phase devices. Then that's the difference. So these internal variables are typically in these kind of applications what you can actually control. What interact on the network, over the network, are these terminal variables that are externally observable. The mapping between internal variables that you actually control 
and external variables that are observed externally, that mapping may be may not be invertible. That's the issue. That's really the cross of the three phase uh, three phase uh, module. Let me just look at the time. Okay, four more minutes. Whether the, your three phase device is a current source, which may model, which is exactly the model of a charger, or it can be a constant power source or impedance and so on. It's the same story. There are internal variables which may be the only thing you can control. They will induce terminal variables which are observed externally and which interact with the network. So the connection between internal variables and the terminal variables is really the key if you have to look at unbalanced state system. So that's the issue. Okay, so one last time on motivation. If you don't do that, so this is actually the uh, charging that if you don't do the proper three phase uh, the marking, then you think you are controlling your charging so that all the safety constraints are satisfied. But in reality, they do not. So you, you can have phases B and C that violates the safety constraint. Whereas if you do the proper three phase monitoring, then you need to make sure that every phase conforms to the safety constraint. Um, okay. Okay, I still have three minutes. So let me say how, how you think about this. Um, so if you, if you think about how you model a system, where is a single phase or three phase? You model the device, whether you can model the device as a voltage source, say a generator, as a current source, like a load, or a impedance or constant power source. So that's a device model. And then you model your lines and transmissions. You put them together, you write down basically only two things you can write down, the nodal balance equations or nodal power flow equations. That's combined to give you the overall model. In a single phase case, the device model is trivial. In a three phase case, that's the key difference. Again, the transmission model and therefore the network equations are trivial between single phase and three phase. All the complicated subtlety appear at the end of at the device model, whether you need to do that. You don't need to do that if you're controlling at, at this level. You do need to do that if you're controlling at the end end devices. So that, that's the key. I, I oh, that's good. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see what else do I want to say. Okay. So the key question is uh, really how do we think about the conversion between internal variables that you control and the terminal variables that you travel the network? And that mapping is for data configuration is not invertible. And that's where uh, uh, a lot of subtlety comes in. So you have to look at uh, that basically. So um, I, I, I want to leave time for Q&A and therefore, let me skip the details of this. Let me just put the, uh, uh, do I have the, the, the advertisement? Details are here. <laughs> so we can go to Q&A. Um, okay, thank you very much. All right, there's a question here from uh, Craig Lewis. How much flexibility does PowerFlex EV chargers have with respect to set pricing that discourages EV charging during the peak time of use, four to 9 p.m. daily when the grid is most stressed and energy is most uh, expensive? Yeah, so um, I can answer that. So uh, we have a discussion with the site hosts and um, really to figure out what they want um, to do during this period. So some customers will say, hey, uh, track the real-time pricing from pg &E. And so we'll actually, uh, let's say you start your session at 3 p.m. and it goes to 10 p.m. But when it crosses the 4 to 9 p.m., then our rate will actually go up um, to match that. Um, and for example, another case uh, at NREL, uh, they wanted something a little bit more uh, exotic. And that was like, um, the more energy uh, you use, then the price changes. I think it's cheaper as it, you, you get more. So it, it's encouraging uh, people to um, charge as much as you can in your vehicle. Uh, so it, our algorithm has the ability to address either of those uh, situations. Uh, okay, next question from David Cole. Uh, are you working on V to G, so vehicle to grid? Uh, absolutely. So vehicle to grid, um, I think it's going to have a really big year. 
Um, there's been lots of announcements from various manufacturers, including Ford. Uh, Ford's new F-150 has, uh, you know, some backup power uh, solution. Uh, Lucid Air has, has something as well. So um, I think it's really that if you look at the global supply chain for uh, batteries, uh, the automotive sector has uh, really taken a dominant uh, piece of that production. And so um, the stationary storage market has a very little percentage of that of those batteries. So uh, it's going to be way more cost effective to literally buy a, via, uh, a EV that's a battery on wheels than it is to do a battery without wheels. So um, we are actively working on this, and it's um, uh, I think it has a very bright future. So. Are there issues you're taking on to a lot of, or there's like a state velocity in this adoption? For example, like, are you looking at fast charging or are you looking at the emerging tech? Yeah, we do a lot of fast charging today. Um, there's a lot of challenges there. It takes a lot more power to bring in. The construction is uh, very expensive. The chargers themselves are $50,000 a piece. So they're, they're uh, pretty expensive. Also, you get um, the, the cost of energy because of the high spike. That's also very expensive. So it is... Uh, Pretty challenging. Now, on the software side, uh, we're we, we're always waiting for uh, uh, new innovations. And so, like ISO fifteen eleven eight, uh, which is this whole uh, plug in charge, it's basically communications between the charger and the vehicle. Um, so, right now, most public stations you have to plug in and then use a mobile app to like you know uh, pay for the session and whatnot. With ISO 15118, it's like the station can contact your car. It can pull the VIN number. It like knows it's a bi-directional communication so that you don't have to have an app. It's just plug in and go. So for you that are uh, familiar with like Tesla and Tesla superchargers, it's a very good experience to just plug in and then the car starts charging. And that's kind of what, that's the gold standard. And that's where everyone else is trying to try and get to. No. Great. Um, let's see, next question. This is here uh, from Craig. The Clean Coalition is currently staging 30 sites in LA County for solar microgrids and EV charging infrastructure. Each site will need between one and 20 level two EV charging ports. Who at PowerFlex should be contacted for to discuss details? Um, welcome to email me. It's just george at powerflex.com. Um, we are LA County's uh, uh, sole pro provider of EV charging right now. So um, we're happy to help on that. Uh, we can do the solar micro, uh, microgrids as well. Um, we have a lot of battery systems and software to go with that. Cool. Uh, next question from Dirk. Uh, have you looked into vehicle to grid at all? So I think we discussed that. Um, not only controlled charging, but also controlled discharging. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a bi-directional resource that's gonna be really important. So you can charge, um, the vehicle when it's uh, low cost, and then you can provide grid services, um, you know, when when the grid needs it the most. So, absolutely. Um, next question, Craig Lewis, uh, do utilities like SoCal Edison embrace load management designs to allow service ratings and switch gear to be sized for the load management limit, or do they simply force power calculations based on the number of EV charger ports multiplied by the level two power minimum? So this is a great question. Um, and I think the utilities have uh, changed their mindset over the years. So one inherent, I guess, problem, I think, with uh, IOUs, like uh, investor-owned utilities, is that they get paid um, on a port on a fraction of their deployed assets. So they're incentivized to deploy as much hardware as uh, they can in the field. Did I get that right? That's absolutely right. <laughs> yep. So load management, on the other hand, is a tool that allows you to maximize your existing infrastructure. So you can see how there might be a little uh, conflict of interest there. But I think the utilities are realizing that um, the adoption of EVs is coming so fast that you can't just deploy as much hardware as you possibly can. It's just not, not uh, financially responsible and not uh, possible in the time frame that you needed to do that. So. Um, Util we've worked with many utilities and they know who we are. We actually just got um, adaptive load management trademark. And uh, in a lot of these uh, investor uh, IOU programs, 
that have funding for EV charging, um, load management is becoming a requirement in those programs. So it's a, it's a big win for load management. And I think that um, they're really changing their mindset on that. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else? All right, from Anonymous. Uh, does adaptive charging network mean an optimal deployment of chargers? What's the factor that, ha what factors have the most impact on this problem? Is it human behavior? Um, yeah, I would say like, there's a lot of psychology behind this too. So when somebody plugs in, um, a lot of times they expect full power right away until their car is done, right? Maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's just, they want to make sure that their car's absolutely charged. Now, that's why in our mobile apps, um, it's really important to give a five hour forward projection of the charging curve to the driver. That way you are addressing their anxiety. Like when you plug in and it's only charging at half speed, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of worried. They're like, is this really gonna finish or not? So providing that forward projection, I think is one of the most important ones. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, Eduardo, is PowerFlex also interested in residential chargers? My energy comes from PCE, for Peninsula Clean Energy, San Mateo. Will you work with a CCA like PCE to, so my EV is helping the grid? Also, have you been talking mostly about consumption? Are you PowerFlex, are you PowerFlex also looking to the production, uh, production part of DER, solar panels and batteries? So yeah, we worked with many, many CCAs, um, especially around this area, and um, they have incentive programs. So we've been deploying a lot of chargers in their service territory, um, mainly in um, condos and apartments. Um, I think the strategy there is that if you deploy in a uh, multi-family housing, that that gives access to a lot more families at one time, right? Uh, we actually don't do any residential like single family home chargers at this time. We may do that in the future, but that is a totally different set of uh, problems and optimizations. Uh, okay, anonymous, uh, really appreciated the discussion on the three phase unbalanced power flow. <laughs> Should get the name, okay. Anonymous, it says, uh, how much more value do you think a more vertically integrated hardware system could unlock? For example, do you see value in owning the BMS or having access to the BMS and solar inverter control systems and how much value if so? Yeah, it's it's um, very important. Um, and that's why we actually at PowerFlex, we have a um, certification program where we bring in a lot of different vendors and their products and we um, test them uh, extensively. And uh, what I mean by that is like we get uh, we usually try to ask them for as much uh, access into their hardware as possible, uh, like into the BMS um, and getting uh, uh, stats, like maybe temperature, health, uh, cycles, like all these things, as much information as we can get, because that only helps our algorithms, uh, you know, uh, treat the battery better in this case and, and so forth. So, uh, yes it does provide a lot of value if you're vertically integrated. I think a good example of that is Tesla. Like they've got everything from the cars, chargers, batteries, and you can see it's a very seamless uh, system that they've, they've built. Okay, uh, Eduardo again. Oh, sorry, this is, sorry, repeat. Um, is PowerFlex business model profitable without incentives? Um, yeah, I think so. It depends on what vertical. Um, we have a lot of Fortune 500 companies um, who paid us for chargers that have no incentives whatsoever. And what's really interesting about this that we realized early on, especially in the Silicon Valley, is that if you look at all the costs uh, pertaining to EV chargers, like the infrastructure, the charging station itself, um, you know, the uh, all the permitting, the you know, and uh, what you find out is that the cost of the employee uh, to go and move their vehicle is actually the most expensive thing out of the whole equation, right? So uh, a lot of uh, companies here in the Bay Area, like they get a lot of perks, you know, free food, free laundry, whatever, you know? And so free charging is um, one that you'll find at many 
uh, many large companies, and it's all an you know HR type of uh, optimization, right? You want to make it easy for your employees to come onto campus, you know, do what they were hired to do, and then stay as long as possible. So uh, there are certainly many situations where it is profitable without incentive. Okay, uh, Dennis Silverman, can you use multiple phases to label power by its fossil fuel or renewable source? Is that for you, or is that? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, so the quick answer is yes. Um, so actually we have a project at Caltech now to look at campus decarbonization and where this is one thing that uh, we're, we're trying to get there. So, so what is important is that you need to know the circuit, uh, the, the entire how the three-phase circuit is laid out so that you know which circuit, even on which phase, is connected to what kind of generation source, whether it's the cold gen plant, whether it's the grid power, or whether it's solar panel. So with that piece of information, then indeed, you will have that information. I guess the, the underlying question is that with this information, then you can in, uh, take this into account in your EV charging optimization. If you want to, let's say, charge in a way that will minimize your carbon emission, for example, then that is possible to do. And also, I assume like each generation source has a very unique signature. You can yeah. put some you can put some machine learning on it, and yeah. you can probably detect it um, pretty easily. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from Ranshin Ying, uh, how the power how does PowerFlex deal with the communication to the chargers, mostly open protocol like OCPP or cloud to cloud API? Any challenge in talking to commercial chargers? So. Yeah, OCPP is Open Charge Point Protocol. is just a standard that most chargers use nowadays. So you can tell it like start charging, stop, speed up, slow down, uh, authorize, you know, turn off, like just basic commands. So that's what we do as well. Uh, we support any chargers that are OCPP compliant, and so um, that that works pretty well uh, nowadays. Uh, five years ago, that wasn't the case. Uh, we had to build. Uh, custom communication chips to go into each charger and then uh, do it that way. But nowadays it's it's uh, pretty stable. So yeah. Uh, from Dirk, do you have any research positions at PowerFlex or should we go to Caltech for that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think both, but I think for the real hardcore stuff, certainly Steven, I think wow. is, is good. <laughs> the useful stuff then talk to both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who do you consider PowerFlex to be top, PowerFlex's top competitor? What do you think your competitive edge is? Is it the adaptive load charging? Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're kind of doing like the work of five startups at one time, um, which is challenging, but I think there's a lot of rewards to that. So we're doing the EV, storage, solar, microgrids so you might have like in storage you might have someone like stem that's just doing storage uh in charging you might have charge point um solar might be like uh, solar city or sunrun um and and so forth right so uh, we really believe that the joint optimization is a game changer because you need to have all those things talk to each other um in a in a choreographed way they can't just be all optimized for themselves right so I think it's really that um, that unification, um, and of course, yeah, the adaptive load management is is important. Uh, we're the number one um, provider for number of sites above thirty stations in the United States. So that's that's uh, uh, de definitely because of the the algorithm. Um, and finally, it says, is the hardware part of the level two charging considered more commodity at this point? Yes, it is. Um, the charger is is uh, pretty simple when it when you think about what it does. Uh, but um, we actually have our own charger now, and that's because we look at a lot of people's chargers and we said, "Hey, like let's take the best things from every single one and then put it into one." And that's that's what we've done. Yeah, but it is a commodity. Uh, do you, uh, last question from Dirk, it says, do you also optimize for battery longevity? Um, so when we look at a new project, um, we do a financial model to see uh, what that operational period is supposed to be. Maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 15, 20. And so based on what the customer is looking to do, uh, 
we will cycle the battery to meet those objectives. Um, yeah, so it is considered. But I would say that um, if you look at a meaningful battery that's like half a million dollars, like you want to be able to save at least that much money over the operational period. So um, at, at least that much. So generally the longevity, whether it lasts 18 years versus 15 years, like it's not that big of a difference. So cool. I think that's all from the uh, online section. Thank you, speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.